Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, session uh, titled To Stand or Not to Stand, and we're going to discuss a couple of uh, complex PCI um, uh, cases. I would uh, like uh, to uh, think that you should attend this session. Uh, if you want to discuss and learn about cases and decide if all the procedures that are presented require stenting. And uh, this session is with a particular emphasis on the use of drug-coated balloon. And we are going to discuss specifically on DCB with regards to indication of its use, the importance of vessel preparation prior to DCB, and subsequently in assessing the results post-DCB. As you know, the, uh, with regards to the accepted or established uh, indication for the use of DCB, and particularly the pachytaxel DCB, it is in the use for treatment of instant restenosis and uh, for small vessel disease where there's fairly strong data. There are other circumstances that are listed where you can use and utilize DCB, for example, in bifurcation lesion, in de novo lesion, and the others that are listed. When you look at the uh, technology of drug-coated balloon, the drug is coated onto the balloon with an excipient, and this is called the matrix coating. When the balloon is inflated, the drug will then go into the tissue and acclimate the plug. And the fact that it is coating throughout the balloon, it gives a more homogeneous uh, illusion of the drug into the tissue. So when you look at some of the advantages of using DCB, besides homogeneous drug elution into the tissue, you do not use a stent, therefore the risk of stent thrombosis is not evident. And when you treat uh, patients lesions that has the side branch, there will be no stent struts to obstruct the side branch ostia. There is a potential that you can use a much shorter DAPT duration, and you allow the vessel to function normally since the vessel is not caged by a metallic stem. At the same time, there has now been shown that uh, in a sub sub uh, substantial number of patients, in at least 70% uh, of patients, you actually have late lumen enlargement of the coronary arteries on follow-up assessment by an angiogram. So this is something which is good because you can actually have vessel enlargement leading on to lumen enlargement. So what we are going to discuss are the cases, which is number one, is de novo proximal LED stenosis, and secondly, bifurcation lesion. And uh, to assist me in this uh, presentation would be my two other panelists, colleagues from uh, UK, Dr. Simon Ackleshaw, and also Dr. Bruno Scheller from Germany. And we hope that uh, at the end of this uh, proceedings, uh, session, you'll be able to understand and appreciate the use of DCB in the complex uh, cases that we are going to show for you. So I'm going to share with you a patient with a de novo lesion in a proximal LED. And uh, we'll see how we're going to treat this or manage this patient. This is a 62 year old gentleman with familial hyperlipidemia. And I've been treating him for more than 20 years. He had uh, an inferior ST elevation MI in 1997 and he had PCI to the right coronary artery, and this was during the time of bare metal stents. In the year 2002, he had a PCI to the left circumflex lesion, and in 2015, 13 years later, he had instant restenosis in the distal right coronary artery. This was treated with a drug-coated balloon, and there were new lesions to, uh, in the proximal and mid-RCA, and this was stented from the ostal to the distal right. He remained rather well, but on assessment by a stress echo in October of 2018, there was ST depression noted in the ECG and there was stress-induced ischemia with hypokinesia in the right, in the, uh, in the LED territory. So we suggested that he should undergo a repeat angiogram. And uh, this was done about two months later these are still images to show that uh, there is significant stenosis in the proximal LED. And uh, these images are to show that there are also fairly significant calcification in the proximal and mid LED. This is a picture of the right. The stems in the right are patent and the distal segment into the PL branch, the site that was treated with DCB was also patent and the flow was good. 
there was only a, uh, an occlusion of the PD brain. Uh, the other images also showed another lesion in a fairly sizable high obtuse marginal branch. There was stenosis in a proximal segment at two sides. So what we did was uh, we prepared the lesion uh, in the LED. And in this case, I elected to use a scoring balloon. And at 18 atmospheres, the balloon was rather full and there was no wasting of the balloon seam. So at least the calcification showed that the lesion gave way with the scoring balloon. And this was the results after. Perhaps you can play the images, so thank you very much. And you can see that the flow is all right, but uh, there is a dissection seen at the, just before the bend. And you can see that there is some dye which is holding up and it was fairly persistent at the end of the injection. But the flow was still with free flow. So my question to you is, how would you treat this patient especially this is a lesion in a proximal LED, a de novo lesion, and there is a type, uh, I would probably say a type C dissection, but with good TME free flow. So once again, let's have a look at the images, uh, moving images of both uh, to, for you to appreciate the lesion and dissection uh, and uh, with uh, some persistence of dying. So let's uh, open this uh, discussion within uh, all the, within panelists. Uh, perhaps you can bring back uh, Dr. Simon and also Professor Bruno Scheller on, uh, uh, on the screen, and we can actually discuss uh, how uh, they would uh, take and treat this, uh, uh, you know, this current situation uh, following uh, vessel preparation. So let's start with Simon. How would you go on, Simon? Do you think that the dissection is bad, that, uh, that you think it should be centered? So um, my initial interpretation of the angiogram is you've done a very nice uh, lesion preparation with an appropriate sized balloon. You have Timmy 3 flow at the end of the procedure. The patient presumably has no chest pain. The only outstanding issue really, as you've highlighted, is that you have some contrast staining which persists, um, which would classify it as a type C dissection. But I think we've now all learned that the old dissection grades are perhaps a little bit open to more interpretation than we used to think so particularly in the setting of better angiography and the use of dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, there are a number of ways you could approach this. One would be that you just wait for a considerable period of time to see whether there's any limitation of flow. Um, another would be that you could go back and do further lesion preparation. And certainly in my practice, what I've found is if I can't make my mind up as to whether or not I've done a good enough uh, lesion preparation. If I go back again with a cutting or scoring balloon, perhaps slightly higher pressure or for a little bit longer, after that it tends to clarify the situation one way or the other. Either I now have an extremely good stable result or I know that it needs stenting. Bruno, before I ask you how you go on uh, to treat this patient, do you think that uh, you would treat the vessel or rather prepare the lesion uh, in other means or do you think it's, it was adequate? Because I found that at 18 atmospheres, the balloon was quite full and I thought it was enough vessel preparation. What would you do? My, my general um, uh, concept is the same as you did. Uh, start with a semi-compliant balloon sometimes and, and use scoring balloon um, as often as, as possible. Um, I would have uh, thought about using in addition non-compliant balloon with very high pressure due to the a uh, huge amount of calcification, um, uh, which is in the area of the lesion. Um, furthermore, I agree uh, with Simon that maybe I would have done another one or two longer inflations with the scoring balloon, just to see if I can um, uh, mo modify the, this, this dissection. Sometimes it's possible to um, to put it more to the to the wall and 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 uh, bring it to a type B dissection. Um, but but this is only uh, trial and error, um, and you can't uh, really predict what, what the outcome. So uh, if you were to come back now, you're looking at the lesion post uh, balloon uh, that I've done, and, and that was the stage I was. Would you consider stenting? Are you comfortable with that type C dissection? Or would you say that, uh, as Simon said, maybe you wait for a while and see the results and then decide whether you need to stand on DCB that you should? Um, if we go back to uh, the DCB consensus uh, group recommendation, 
this is clearly type C dissection, and this means it should be stented. This is right. uh, this is a very simple answer. Um, however, um, the more you do uh, in uh, DCB only treatment over the years, the more appearance you gain. Uh, you learn that not every type C dissection is the same. Um, and the next question is, is the flow good enough um, to take the risk and, and leave it without stenting? Um, and then meanwhile, I tend to use in this situation additional tools like FFR measurement and then uh, decide what to do. This means if I would have an FFR of only 0.8, I would tend to stand it, to be honest. If it's better, if it's 0.9 or 8.5, something like that, I would uh, try it without that. So that's, uh, that's not the way uh, our consensus group recommends it, but uh, I think it's, a, it's feasible and it, it's safe in my experience. Yeah. So coming back to that, uh, uh, Simon, because both of you are in the, in the International Guidelines Committee, so you did say that one is uh, FFR of at least more than 0 0.8. In your own practice, Simon, do you use, uh, frequently use FFR to help to guide in terms of uh, treatment and use of DCB? Um, to be honest, I don't. And that's partly because I, I relearned my angioplasty based on um, and just the angiographic result. Mm. Occasionally, we use pressure wires afterwards. We use a lot of pressure wires to decide whether or not we're going to perform angioplasty in mm. the first case. Um, when we do have pressure wires in at the end, then we're certainly working to at least make the lesion non-ischemic. Mm. Um, I think it, there's a lot of interest and work and discussion around what results you need in order mm. to be able to safely leave it. Anecdotally, I have seen a few cases whereby with the pressure wire in situ, dissections that are causing a problem, you can actually see the, the gradient increase as the dissection and the hematoma progress. Uh, and I've seen a couple of those, which is, which is very interesting. So short answer, no, I don't use FFR most of the time, certainly to guide my DCB result, because quite often we're not actually working on a pressure wire. So uh, I'm just going to spend just a bit more with regards to the FFR because this is something new in the guidelines and also our own Asia Pacific uh, panel uh, uh, guidelines uh, in, uh, for DCB. So the principle for uh, FFR is really to identify lesions that would be able to be uh, acceptable for DCB and therefore reduce the risk of uh, converting to a DS. So it's like Simon said, uh, how long do you think we should wait a while before we, uh, you know, we measure with FFR? Do you think almost immediately? Because it does take some time to prepare the FFR and run through the adenosine. So probably uh, by the time that uh, you run in and you've got a fairly acceptable result, then it will tell you that, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, quite appropriate to use DCB if the FFR is uh, good enough. Uh, as in the guidelines, uh, at least uh, uh, more than zero, at least more than zero point eight. I think the setup time is a reasonable amount of time to wait. Yes, I'd yes. agree with All that. Right. Okay. Is there any uh, further discussions or further important aspects with regards to vessel preparation that we need uh, before we go on uh, to see what I how I did the procedure? No, I think I think you've done a very nice uh, procedure there. Uh, yeah. One thing we tend to do is we don't go to such high pressures immediately. And I probably spend all day in the lab and might not go over six atmospheres with any of my balloons for a whole day. Mm. Uh, and then we go to higher pressures if necessary. Um, and as I perhaps mentioned earlier, we have a checklist for after the angioplasty, which is, do you have Timmy 3 flow? Is there a vessel threatening dissection, which obviously is, is one of the things open to discussion at the moment. Does the patient have any pain? Is the contrast in a particular bit of the vessel that's remaining there for a long period of time, because that's certainly something that would then prompt us to look at it in more detail or wait for a bit longer, or perhaps, as you said, go for an FFR. Okay, so uh, perhaps we can just go back to uh, the case, uh, to my slides uh, once again. So this is where we left. So I did uh, what uh, was, uh, uh, you know, how I treated the patient, I, uh, con uh, you know, Followed as what you suggested, uh, what you actually offered. I waited for five minutes and I took another shot, and the results were similar with Timmy 3 flow 
the residual stenosis is less than 30%. So I said, this is something that perhaps uh, we can try to do with DCB. And I used a 3.0 by 40 mm. I inflated at 10 atmospheres for 90 seconds. And uh, that was the result after, so fairly pleasing. And uh, there was no compromise in flow or worsening of dissection. And to ensure that uh, the results are sustainable, I treated the high OM lesion first. So at least after treating the high OM lesion and when I come back and take the final shot, if the flow is still good, results are still acceptable, then I know that the risk of abrupt closure is going to be very low. So the high OM was treated with a 2.0 mm regular balloon. And that was the result after. Once again, it looks fairly pleasing. Uh, there is some mild dissection, non-flow limiting, and uh, the TIMI flow is uh, TIMI-3. And I also elected to treat that with DCB 2.25 by 15 mm uh, for seven, at seven atmospheres for about 80 seconds. And uh, this is uh, the results after. You can see that uh, the OM lesion is acceptable results, even though there's uh, dissection noted, a bit of haziness, but the flow in the high OM is very good. And uh, this is 15 minutes post DCB. When you look at the results in the LED, 30 minutes after DCB, uh, you can see that the persistence of dye is still there, residual stenosis is less than 30%, and the flow is still TIMI 3 flow. And this was also seen in other views. So we decided to accept this, and uh, you know he did very well. There was no chest pain, no new ECG changes. In fact, there was uh, no significant CK leak, and he was discharged the following day. We had a chance of bringing him back uh, to be restarted seven months down the line. And here you see the uh, high OM lesion uh, that was significant now turned out to be uh, much better. It, uh, there is hardly any uh, uh, you know, uh, significant residual stenosis. And uh, we also looked at the LED and the LED is still very good. And it's all, uh, similar to the point that uh, post index procedure seven months uh, prior. And just to show you the uh, flow, the flow is good. Uh, the contrast holding up uh, is no longer there, so the lesion has healed. And uh, therefore, with regards to the summary of case, I showed you a de novo proximal LED lesion. I think uh, that has uh, what has been discussed is that lesion preparation is key, especially when you want to consider DCB. Uh, the vision, of course, that I had was uh, uh, whether we can use DCB or stent, especially when there was a type C that section. But uh, in, in this case, I really want to try uh, and uh, plan for DCB. So I needed to be a bit more patient and, uh, and then restudy after about waiting about five minutes. And when uh, it was uh, still very good flow, uh, this suggests that if I were to use DCB, the, uh, the risk of abrupt closure and conversion to a stenting is going to be very low, as what is seen in this patient. And we have also discussed about the use of FFR for the treatment uh, on the use of DCB and to assess final results. I just want to uh, highlight uh, what is the latest uh, DCB-only strategy for PCI guidelines by the International uh, Guideline Committee, uh, of which Bruno and also Simon is uh, part of the committee. So the importance is really with regards to optimal lesion preparation. And this is by pre with either standard balloon. And uh, in this case, since it was calcified, I decided to use specialty balloons. And, this, uh, and what is being said, a specialty balloons are scoring balloon, cutting balloon, non-compliant balloon. And sometimes you may even have to consider arthrectomy by rotablation or uh, uh, orbital arthrectomy system with the diamond back system or even with shockwave balloon. And uh, we have also discussed about uh, uh, FFR measurement that may help to guide our guide uh, our PCI. So once after optimal lesion preparation, we will have to assess if the suboptimal angiographic results, which is uh, flow limiting dissection, residual stenosis of more than 30%, and if you use FFR, FFR is low, then you have no option but uh, to treat with uh, DES. But if you have acceptable angiographic results, and these are important uh, you know, guidelines in terms of uh, non-flow limit intersection, less than 30% residual stenosis, therefore you can use DCB uh, and, uh, and, and therefore uh, you know, get fairly good results immediate and hopefully in the 
long-term result. So it's it's my pleasure to be invited along for this discussion of complex angioplasty, particularly focusing on drug-coated balloons and whether or not we should be using stents. Uh, my name's Sam Essel, I work in the UK, but I'd like to present is bifurcation angioplasty. So setting the scene, this is a 58-year-old gentleman that was admitted to our hospital with an anterior non-SD elevation myocardial infarction. This was confirmed by enzymes, anterior T-wave changes on his ECG and a hypokinetic anterior wall on echocardiography. When he was taken to the catheter lab, pictures of his right coronary artery showed that his distal left anterior descending artery was collateralized by a large epicardial vessel and he had a very complex LAD D1 subtotal occlusion. So we went on to wire both branches and then used a 3.0 non-compliant balloon within the LAD in order to more clearly define the anatomy and decide on our treatment strategy. So we wired both branches of the LAD and diagonal used a 3.0 non-compliant balloon within the LAD which as you can see on the right then more clearly defined the anatomy so we could work out our um, treatment strategy. As you can see there's a long LAD lesion and a long diagonal branch lesion with a true Medina 111 classification and I'd like to open up to discussion with the panel as to how they think we should progress in this case. So if we can have the panel members up on the screen please. I'd like to perhaps ask Bruno first um, what he thinks of the anatomy and how he'd like to take the case forward. So um, I'm thinking about what to do with the diagonal branch. You, you did only pre-dilatation so far for the, for the LAD uh, right. without a rel relevant occlusion of the, of the origin of the side branch. So um, there are two options, in, in my opinion. There could be a very simple strategy, uh, only treating the LAD and only treating with, with, with DCB, because we know that we have uh, lumen enlargement in majority of cases over time. And this includes also uh, an improvement of the origin of the side branches. So this, this would be a very uh, a simplistic, simplistic way of, of doing this procedure. The other option, um, which I would prefer in this uh, situation, is to predilate uh, the diagonal two um, and uh, optimize uh, the uh, predilatation result of the LAD, and then finally treat both branches uh, with DCB if possible. Um, but this is a more complex procedure, and maybe the simpler version would also be. Uh, be a good option. So Simon, I think uh, a lot of uh, people will just uh, stent the main vessel, which is the LED, and uh, see the results, whether they need to treat uh, the diagonal. And uh, for some people who actually use uh, DCB, they will then think about uh, treating the side branch with DCB. But the only concern I have in this is that, number one, it is a bifurcation lesion. So any stenting of the main vessel can impede, impede the flow in the diagonal and you may have difficulty in trying to rewire. Secondly, there's also a large septal branch. And once again, if you put a stent uh, across and you might actually lose that septal branch. So in cases like this, uh, I would try and see after pre dilatation I would uh, in this case, uh, probably uh, use a scoring balloon in a main vessel and then see the results. If the results are acceptable and geographically, and uh, then I would consider using DCB as much as possible. If the flow is not good, obviously I need to stand there. I would uh, think that uh, the diagonal being a large diagonal and it's diffusely diseased from the ostium to proximal requires to be treated. So I would uh, again uh, predilate the diagonal and see the results and I would then treat uh, the diagonal. If uh, uh, if I were to be able to use uh, DCB for both main vessel and side branch, I would. Uh, it doesn't really matter where I would treat first, uh, either main vessel or side branch with DCB. But if I do need to stand, uh, stand the main vessel, then it is uh, my practice to DCB the diagonal 
and then put in the stem because it's so much easier to treat the side branch first before putting the uh, main vessel stem. And sometimes after putting main vessel stem, you might have difficulty trying to cross into the diagonal. So vessel preparation is key for both. And then uh, I will decide uh, on subsequent uh, treatment strategy, but DCB if it's possible. So I think you've raised a very interesting point and it's one that gets asked a lot, which is if you are using a drug coated balloon in the side branch, do you do this before or after stent in the main vessel, if your yeah. strategy is a stent in the main vessel? Um, yes. My approach is, I think, the same as yours. If you know up front you want to treat the side branch, you treat that first with a drug-coated balloon, and then if you have to stent the main vessel, stent it, and then not pursue the side branch again unless you've got uh, a problem with flow. The only time, really, therefore, that you that use drug-coated balloon after the event is in a provisional approach where you have to go and chase the side branch because stenting yeah. in itself has therefore compromised the flow. Um, so generally most DCB outside stents and side branches is performed beforehand in a planned manner and a few are performed afterwards more as a bailout approach. So um, what I'd like to do now is go back and show you exactly how we did the case so we can have the angiogram. So that's the 3 0 non-compliant balloon, which defines the anatomy. And to my mind shows that we have a lot of disease within the diagonal branch uh, that we felt needed treating. And there's a long LAD lesion that's a lot larger than the 3 0 balloon that we've just used. So we went for approach um, a similar to, I suspect, what both the panelists just suggested we used a non-compliant balloon in the diagonal branch back up into the LAD and then a larger 4 non-compliant balloon along the length of the LAD lesion. As I mentioned earlier we tend to use lower pressures perhaps than some other operators and I think if the balloon is fully dilated at six atmospheres along its length we would accept that as a good first attempt at a balloon result which obviously is then dictated by your angiographic outcome. This was the yeah. acute result after using balloons that we felt were the right size for the diagonal branch and for the left anterior descending artery. I think there's a small degree of recall perhaps within the LAD and I'd like the panelists to now tell me what they think of our angioplasty result and hopefully they liked it, uh, but also what they now think they're uh, treatment strategy is going to be. I, I think the results are fairly uh, good, ex uh, acceptable results because you can see that firstly the flow is good, there's hardly any dissection, uh, and uh, there is the residual stenosis is less than 30%. So I think both uh, the diagonal and the LED uh, showed acceptable angiographic results. In fact, if you were to ask me, uh, the concerns about whether, which is a concern about, uh, especially abrupt closure or long-term, uh, you know, uh, poor outcomes, then I would uh, actually accept uh, a dissection, which is non-flow limiting, uh, better than a residual stenosis of more than 30%, because the risk of coming back will be much less in my experience when you have a non-flow limiting dissection. You have drug which is uh, penetrate uh, deeper into the tissue. The vessel will heal and subsequently you can have vessel enlargement. Uh, so coming back to your uh, case, uh, Simon, I would uh, I think it's ready to use a DCB. I would use DCB for diagonal first and then the LED. Uh, and I would uh, then see the final results. If they're still good, then uh, I would uh, be happy with the results. The diagonal branch has some haziness, um, I would say. So this is not uh, a perfect result for DCB treatment and if, uh, this have been the case in the LAD, uh, I would not be satisfied, to be honest. Mm. Um, but for a diagonal branch, it's fine, I would say. Um, and the LAD has very good uh, result after predilatation. And uh, it's interesting to see that you used a 4.0 balloon for this predilatation. Uh, I, I would have taken a 3.5, to be honest, in, in this situation. But uh, it's, it's interesting to see that if you use a bigger balloon with low pressure, you may uh, have uh, such nice results. So that's very interesting, I think. And for the strategy, uh, I fully agree what, what uh, Rosalie said, with the, the, same, the same strategy. Thank you. So um, if we are now heading towards drug-coated balloons, how would you 
intend to do this? Would you use any kissing? Would you kiss with the drug coated balloons? Would you use one balloon, one drug coated balloon and a non-compliant balloon in the other branch? Or would you just keep it very simple with sequential DCBs? So one of the, the critical issues when using DCB is um, time to deliver uh, the drug to the lesion. That's, that's one, one of the things you have to learn when you use DCB. Um, and this means if you try to do kissing DCB, then the first balloon you, you insert uh, will stay too much long in blood and will lose a uh, drug uh, from the surface. Uh, therefore, um, I strongly recommend to use it sequentially and um, start with the diagonal branch and then use it in the, in the main branch. I fully agree uh, from that point of view. In fact, uh, if let's say I were to use sequentially and I find that the results are acceptable, I would actually stop there and not have any kissing at all. Uh, but if you decide in the end of being uh, having kissing that it uh, should be low pressure to ensure that you avoid dissecting uh, the main vessel. Uh, that's number one. Uh, about putting uh, the uh, uh, drug coated balloon sequentially, it depends also on the size of the guiding catheter you use. So if, for example, you use a, a six French guiding catheter uh, and you put in dilate uh, the diagonal, it would be better to actually remove the catheter and then put in, an, uh, sorry, remove the balloon and put in a new balloon. Just in case, if let's say your balloon cannot go through, then uh, you may have to uh, retract the balloon and then, uh, you know, by that time, there's still some amount of drug which has been eluted from the balloon. So I think in terms of uh, quickness, uh, rapidness of trying to deliver the balloon, it would be safer to do sequentially with one balloon out before you think about wanting to kiss, if there is a need to kiss. So, thank you. So, so thank you for that last point. The, I think it's very interesting that drug-coated balloon angioplasty being partly driven by the fact that you have to deliver the, the balloons within a short period of time actually makes the procedure a lot more simplified in these complex settings. So sequential drug-coated balloons is a much easier, more straightforward approach. And you are driven by the fact that you have to deliver the drug within a short period of time, but therefore your procedure becomes easier. Um, and the need for ever doing a kissing balloon is not quite zero, but very close to it. So if we could go back to my angiogram again, please, and I'll show you what we decided to do. So that was the acute result after uh, what we thought was fairly good, if perhaps optimal balloon angioplasty. So we then used sequential DCB, so a long 2-5 drug coated balloon in the diagonal branch. We go for an inflation of usually six atmospheres for 30 seconds. We then used a long 4-0 drug coated balloon within the left anterior descending artery across the diagonal branch. Again, low pressure, 30 seconds only. And the acute result looks like this. So the checklist that we run through in our department would be, uh, is the patient well? Do they have any pain? Do they have ACG changes? Is the TIMI-3 flow in the vessel? How much recoil can we see? Is there a vessel threatening dissection that we're um, concerned about? And in particular, as always, is the contrast accumulating and hanging up in any part of the vessel that we've just treated, which would then trigger us to look at that part of the vessel in more detail. So that's the checklist that we run through. And again, I'd be interested to know from the panel what they think of that acute post DCB result. Very nice result. Um, my little concern uh, remains with respect to the diagonal branch. There is a dissection, there is haziness. Um, and I'm not sure if we fulfill the criterion of um, uh, less than 30% residual sources in this case. But I would leave it like it is. Why? Because you have a good flow, to me, free flow is, is, is clearly there. And we can expect that there will be loom enlargement over time. So the hope is that it will look better um, uh, after a few months. And it's only in brackets. Um, a diagonal branch, it's not a main branch. Therefore, I'm satisfied with the diagonal um, and the LAD looks really fine. So that's, that's a perfect result. I, I wouldn't have any other uh, different uh, views from uh, Bruno because uh, I would uh, accept these results. 
Uh, the only slight difference, uh, perhaps, if I were to do this case, is I would uh, choose a slightly shorter uh, balloon for the LED because uh, the balloon is very long, and my all, my concern will always be that uh, the risk of dissection in parts that you may not want to treat uh, in, uh, in the end. So I, other than that, I would uh, uh, you know agree with the way that you've done it. Uh, it's just a shorter balloon for the LED. That's that's about all. Okay, thank you. I, I didn't for um, brevity. I didn't actually show that we used that that short four O non compliant balloon over a much longer course of oh, the yeah. LED. All right. Okay. So uh, right. we were covering everything that we'd lesion prepared with the four O balloon beforehand. Yeah, so but that's very important. That's very important point, Simon, because uh, everywhere they touch, you should actually treat uh, with DCB and avoid the geographical mismatch. Yep. I think it was the size of non-compliant balloons that we had on the shelf at the time. We only had a short one, so it just meant for more, more inflations. Yeah. Um, so if we can now go back to the angiogram again. So this was the acute result. And obviously what we would also be very interested in is the sustainability of the result. So this is the four month angiogram. Um, rather than me describing it to you, I'll ask my panelists again what they think of the four month follow up result. Perhaps we start with Rosalie this time. Yeah. Only if you tell me it's perfect. <laughs> well, there is still some vessel stenosis. Uh, I was really hoping that there would be some vessel enlargement uh, over time. But really, uh, even with the vessel stenosis, it's not significant and the flow is good. And uh, this is something that I'll be very happy about, especially knowing that, uh, you know, you can leave nothing behind and you avoid putting in stents in the LED. Uh, with respect to the diagonal branch, uh, um, there is some lumen enlargement uh, compared to the, the acute result. And the, very importantly, the dissection is healed. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, what, that's one of the important things if you start doing DCB only procedures, you should have angiographic follow-up in those patients to learn uh, what happens with the dissections to see that if you have good flow acutely, um, it's safe and you have improved long-term outcome. And, and that's, that's really unique for, for this technology compared to centuries. So this was the, the four month follow-up and um, I agree with Bruno that what, what we've shown quite nicely there is that the diagonal branch has some late lumen gain, the left anterior turning artery doesn't, but I certainly think it's a good enough result. And as the patient yeah. was um, asymptomatic, this, this is a, a great case to, I think, show the point. So if you go to my last slide, I think what I'm trying to get across from the point of view of bifurcation angioplasty is, um, it is more complex, particularly when you start using stents and the more complicated your stent strategy, the more complicated the angioplasty becomes. But actually, it is very safe and becomes greatly simplified by the use of drug-coated balloon angioplasty instead. But good lesion preparation in these cases is mandatory. Uh, most complex lesions can be dealt with in this manner. And in fact, as they become more complex, drug-coated balloon angioplasty becomes more appealing rather than complex stenting. Kissing and potting and all these complicated stent procedures are virtually never required. And I think the kiss kiss strategy works quite well, which is obviously keep it simple, keep it stent free. So that concludes my talk on bifurcation, angioplasty, and we'll now move into the discussion section. I'm, I'm disappointed that my panelists didn't think it was a perfect long-term result, but I can't have everything, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> next time, next Good time. <laughs> Good enough, <Abby. laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we come uh, to uh, the end of the session, but uh, I'd like to uh, say some key learning points, which is crucial when you utilize DCB. And these are take home messages uh, that you should remember, uh, especially when you treat patients uh, using DCB. So we showed you two cases that were presented in a de novo LD stenosis with a type C dissection post balloon angioplasty and how we waited and then comfortably used DCB. And of course, Simon's case of a true bifurcation lesion and treat both lesions in the side branch and main vessel was treated with DCB. Uh, uh, once again, we would like to stress that lesion preparation is key in complex lesions. 
And uh, this is uh, for all lesions, but in particular, if you want to use DCB. The current recommendation is that if you want to pre-dilate, the balloon to artery ratio should be as close, which is one is to one. And therefore you get less residual risk stenosis and you can then deploy a DCB. Remember, DCB is only to deploy the drug and not to treat the lesion before using DCB. Now, optimal lesion preparation and with the aim for, ex uh, for acceptable angiographic results are based on number one, TME3 must, uh, the flow must be good. There is no major dissection and the restal stenosis has to be less than 30% post POBA. You may need to require arthrectomy devices or specialty balloons in trying to obtain good lesion preparation. And this is with the use of cutting balloon, scoring balloon, and also non-compliant balloon. As with any calcified lesion or fibrotic lesion, you should not have any wasting or very minimal wasting before you decide to use DCB. We also, uh, with Simon's case, uh, discussed about treating bifurcation lesions and the issues surrounding its utilization. We also had a discussion with the use of FFR and uh, especially with the instant rune stenosis, the imaging in, uh, in terms of guiding PCI. So FFR is one of the ways that uh, you may find useful to guide you. Uh, in conclusion, DCB therapy is an attractive therapeutic option. There are uh, certainly a number of advantages over stenting, but it is important for you to aim of, uh, with the aim of getting or gaining confidence that DCB actually works. There has definitely to be a change in practice. You need to be more patient when you do these cases, because otherwise you'll just be reaching out uh, uh, for a stent uh, every time. Remember, optimal lesion preparation, you must not be afraid of all dissections, because when you get minimal dissection, uh, the risk of abrupt closure is going to be very, very small. You just need to practice and practice using DCP till one gets right. Because by doing so, the conversion rate to stenting is going to be very low and you are going to be confident about using DCB in your clinical practice. So as a final slide, DCB is certainly an attractive concept of treating lesions and leaving nothing behind. And I would like to thank my fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Simon Eccleshaw and Professor Bruno Scheller for sharing the session uh, with me for, uh, uh, for this uh, PCR session. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.